So I'd like to welcome you to the first uh, Anlinger Highlight Seminar of, of, the, of the semester. Um, I'm Emily Carter, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm the founding director of the Anlinger Center. Uh, and I wanted to just shamelessly advertise the next seminar that, that will be in two weeks uh, on February 25th. Frank Wolock will be here from Stanford talking about the economics of the smart grid. Uh, but today, I'm delighted to introduce Maureen McCann, who is a professor at Purdue. But she, uh, like a number of us, wear too many hats. And so she is the director of Purdue's Energy Center, as well as the director of an Energy Frontier Research Center that focuses on biofuels that she will be telling us about today. She's a plant biologist. May I call you that? Yes. Um, and I first saw Maureen give uh, a talk at, there, there's something called um, a multi-agency com combustion chemistry research or something like that, Mocker. I, I, Ed Law's in the audience, he'll know the, what the acronym is. Um, but, and I was, I just thought it was a, a wonderful talk and I've been wanting you to come ever since um, to Princeton uh, to tell us about the work of the center and her, and her own work uh, in particular. So I won't take up any more of your time, but we're delighted to have you here today. So, so I'd like to say thanks very much to Emily for um, you know, her invitation. And it's been a really wonderful and exciting day going around and meeting and, and talking with you. I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a plant biologist's perspective on this. But I want to start with um, this histogram. And the reason I think this is interesting is, is its source. So British Petroleum, every year, calculates out how long the proven reserves of fossil fuels will last at current production rates. So this assumes that there's no population increase. There is no increase in energy demand. Just how long will these reserves last if we continue to mine and extract them at current rates? And there's differences country to country. So the former Soviet Union, for example, has over 400 years of supply of coal. In the US, we have very significant supplies now of coal and of natural gas, thanks to, to hydraulic fracking technology. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is the global calculation. And that is that for oil, coal, and natural gas, we have about 100 years supply. Now, we will continue to find additional reserves, but we will also continue with a growing population to have an increased demand on those reserves. And with increasing demand for, uh, for an increased standard of living in developing countries, with considerations of climate change, with increasing urbanization, then we really need to come up with some alternatives to this dependence on fossil fuels. So I'm going to talk about liquid transportation fuels now and focus on, on oil and what our options are. And so, you know, eco economics 101, decreased demand, increased supply. So we could think about more fuel efficient vehicles, increasing the range at which a vehicle can travel on a gallon of gasoline. We can promote conservation behaviors. We can think about light vehicle electrification. And even, even some hybrids, some heavy hybrid vehicles, where uh, we reconfigure the braking system so that batteries can be incorporated into those vehicles too. We can think about increased supply. So getting uh, mining the Athabasca oil sands, the oil shale, super heavy oil from Venezuela, coal or natural gas to liquid fuels. And of course, this is a very current topic with hydraulic fracking being so prevalent. Natural gas provides us with energy independence. It's going to be a huge economic boost, but it doesn't answer the long-term problem of climate security. 
And so my preferred option, and one that I'll argue for, is actually to think about biofuels as our source of liquid transportation fuels. The problem with biofuels from a plant biology perspective is that the land, the water, the fertilizer, and the energy inputs, because agriculture is a really intense, uh, energy-intensive process now. Those, those uh, requirements uh, to grow bioenergy feedstocks are limiting at present. Let me just put this in a, in a kind of sense of scale here. So uh, many people have seen the, the billion ton study. So a DOE report that says that there's a billion tons of lignocellulosic biomass that could be available in a sustainable fashion on an annual basis. If you add together all of our current products from agriculture, so um, fruits, vegetables, hay, pasture, corn grain, rice, all of those agricultural outputs, the total output from our agricultural system at the moment adds up to 800 million tons. And so although a billion tons of lignocellulosic biomass is available, it requires a larger system to process it than our existing agricultural system to utilize that biomass. So I just wanted to say that to give you some sort of sense of scale for how we're thinking about these, these biomass crops. So the next thing to say is, is why do we love, why are we addicted to these fossil fuels? And of course, gas, coal, and oil are all combinations of carbon and hydrogen. We oxidize them through combustion to produce heat to carry out useful work. And the energy return on energy invested to recover these fuels is 30 to 1. So we get tremendous value from extracting these fossil fuels out of the ground. That ratio is going to diminish as we have to tackle less accessible sources of energy. But virtually all of our transportation fuels, of course, are hydrocarbons. And the challenge is that when we look at biomass, it's very oxygen rich. And we can think of that oxygen as somehow diluting the content of carbon and hydrogen that the plant has stored. So some subunits of biomass, such as this molecule, sinapyl alcohol, uh, are relatively energy rich. They're energy rich because they have few oxygens uh, diluting those carbons and hydrogens. But a molecule like glucose, and plant cell walls are roughly two thirds polysaccharide, has many oxygens in here. And so to make energy rich molecules, we need to think of ways of removing that oxygen content. So if instead of our sources of carbon being fossil fuels, if we think of, of plant materials, of lignocellulosic biomass, the bodies of plants, really as a sustainable and renewable source of carbon atoms for a, a sustainable carbon economy, then we can think of how we would use these, this partially reduced carbon uh, in bioenergy production. And there are options here. There are many options, and we should follow all of them because we don't yet know which pathways will be uh, the most energy efficient or the most carbon efficient. We can, for example, consider taking biomass, cooking it in a process called torrefaction, and making a charcoal-like substance where it could be mixed with coal and then burned for power generation. And so if we move to electrification of the light vehicle fleet, this is one option for us to offset the emissions from burning coal. We can also think of pathways that, um, that have been used to produce liquid transportation fuels starting from biomass. So using biomass as a source of sugar that microorganisms ferment to produce a fuel. 
taking the biomass to a higher temperature where it's vaporized into very light molecules, and those are then allowed to condense back down and through Fischer-Tropsch chemistry to produce alkanes, or pyrolysis, which has been studied for some decades, slightly lower temperatures, maybe 400, 500 degrees versus 1,000 or 1,200 degrees, to make a bio-oil where you vaporize the biomass, allow the vapors to condense, and then that bio-oil is somehow catalytically upgraded to produce a fuel. The pathway that I'm, I'm going to talk about um, from our center is actually an alternative pathway of catalytic conversion to produce fuels and, and high-value organics. So what I'd like to do now is just um, give you a short primer on what biomass is, what the major molecular components of it are, and what the substrates are that we're dealing with for this kind of chemical catalysis. So this is a, a scanning electron micrograph of the inside of a, a stem and the stalk of a plant. And um, what we're going to do then, what you can see in here is, is, are these cells of various shapes and sizes. And each one of these plant cells lives inside a box. And that box is the plant cell wall. And it's there to provide strength. And it's there also as a, as a carbon sink, in a sense, because the, the molecules that comprise it are carbon rich. So if I magnify now uh, the area in this small brown box here from maybe a, a cortical cell within this stem, and look at it at high magnification in the, the transmission electron microscope, then this cell wall that the plant cell builds to surround itself is not just cement or jelly. It, it actually has an architecture to it. So in this, this transmission electron micrograph, you can see these thick cables that run the length of the micrograph. These are the cellulose microfibrils. They form the main scaffolding framework of the cell wall. And you can see many other thinner fibers that seem to interconnect those cellulose microfibrils. And these are other kinds of, of polysaccharides. Now, one thing that this architecture does is the structure it produces has many holes in it. So these pores can be filled with water. They can form channels that are for signaling molecules to communicate. But it's a relatively open structure. The pore size in here is maybe about 5 to 10 nanometers uh, in diameter. So this is a close-up of one of those cellulose microfibrils now. And in the atomic force micro microscope, we can see the, the cellulose microfibrils. We can even see maybe the chains of other polysaccharides that may interconnect them. And at high resolution, we may even be able to see the individual glucose residues of which this cellulose microfibril is comprised. And so this is the structure that we think of as, as cellulose. Chains of glucose residues in single uh, glucan chains that are hydrogen bonded to each other to form a very almost crystalline material. There's so many hydrogen bonds in here that cellulose actually has a greater tensile strength than steel. So this is a, a remarkable material. It is also one of the most difficult portions of the, the cell wall to deconstruct. Now, those thinner polysaccharides that seem to interconnect the cellulose microfibrils are a class of polymer we call hemicelluloses for no good reason. It, it was uh, simply an operational definition uh, because they bound closely to cellulose. People originally thought that they were all chains of glucan decorated with different sugars. And indeed, in some species, that's what the hemicellulose is. It's a a polymer of glucose, and it's decorated with xylose residues and maybe a, a few other different sugars. Those xyloglucans, as they're called, are 
typical of dicot species. And the kinds of dicot species we're interested in are really fast growing trees. So poplar or willow or eucalyptus. Other species that we might consider as being bioenergy crops would be the grasses. So maize, rice, and wheat produce 70% of all human calories. They're all grasses. The stalks that they produce could also be used as a source of lignocellulosic biomass. Switchgrass, miscanthus, native prairie grasses, big blue stem, these are all alternative crops that additionally could be used with these uh, waste residues from our current agricultural system. So in these species, in the grasses, the interconnecting polymer between the cellulose microfibrils is not xyloglucan, it's a polymer of xylose. So it is a backbone of xylose and it's decorated with arabinose units. Now let's go to a different cell type within this stem. Let's go to a water conducting cell uh, up here in the xylem or the vascular bundle of the plant. So if I now magnify up this cell type, this is still in the scanning electron microscope, you can see that xylem cell here, and you can see that um, before it, it committed suicide to form a, a hollow water conducting tube within the plant, uh, it deposited an extremely thick cell wall that we're looking at end on here. There is no architecture that we can see within this secondary wall structure. So even if I was to magnify up this area, you wouldn't see any pores. You would see a, almost a flat surface and, as an image. That's because a third kind of molecule, lignin, has been deposited in and around all of those cellulose and hemicellulose molecules and has filled up all of the pores uh, around this particular cell wall. Why are we bothered about this then? We're bothered because these so-called secondary walls, these very thick cell walls, although they only surround some specialized cell types within the plant, they're so recalcitrant to degradation in the field post-harvest that they contribute greatly to the actual amount of biomass. So if we're going to utilize biomass, we need to be able to deconstruct this cell wall. We need to be able to think of, of these three polymers, the cellulose in the grasses, the xylans in the, the dicot species, the fast-growing trees, the xyloglucan, and lignin, and take those molecules apart and make useful fuels and maybe chemicals from them. So our targets here are cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And here's what lignin looks like and why it's the most recalcitrant and difficult to degrade component of the plant cell wall. By mass, it's 15 to 25%, but it contains 40% of the energy content of the biomass, largely because it's made of these aromatic ring structures that are linked to each other by a whole variety of kinds of molecular bonds. And so this is a very, very heterogeneous molecule, very difficult to uh, think of a catalyst that can actually attack all of these different kinds of bonds. And yet there's a huge opportunity here because if we think of the composition of gasoline, it's three quarters alkanes, it's one quarter aromatics, such as benzene and toluene and xylene, and if we think of the biomass, then the polysaccharides, if we can convert those to sugars, we may be able to take the sugars to alkanes. If we could deconstruct the lignin and preserve the aromatic ring structures, we would have maybe some kind of substitute for the aromatics that are in gasoline, or even the 200 or so varieties of aromatics that are found in aviation fuel. Another reason to, to think of lignin not as a, a problem but as an opportunity is that plants require 
the pathway that makes lignin for their resistance to burning from the sun. It's their form of sunscreen for structural support and for water transport in those xylem vessels. So first generation biofuels are with us. Of course, we have a, 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 a not so thriving ethanol industry that takes um, grains from corn or starch from potatoes and can convert them to sugars. We can squeeze sugar beets or sugar canes directly for a source of sugars. And then we can ferment those sugars uh, to produce ethanol or other fuel, and it can be mixed with gasoline. And then seed crops, such as sunflower, we can take those seeds and we can squeeze the oil out of them, transesterify it to make a biodiesel, and again, that is miscible with current fuels. One of the issues, of course, that cropped up uh, a few years ago is, of course, the food versus fuel debate. And this is the whole push towards a lignocellulosic industry because the grain, the kernels on your cob of corn, and even the sugar that you extract from beets or sugar cane is proportionately a very small amount of the plant material. Maize stalks will grow six feet high. Hybrid corn is six feet high in the field. And yet we want to make fuel only from the yellow kernels that are on the outside of this cob. But if we can develop technologies that utilize the whole of the plant body, then we may be able to maximize an, a real source of partially reduced carbon. So bioenergy grasses, fast-growing trees, this was DOE's vision back in 2005 of how we might utilize biomass for a, an ethanol industry. So cut the biomass into shreds, somehow pre-treat it with heat or with chemicals to make the cellulose, those scaffolding poles, accessible to the activity of enzymes. So here's that cellulose microfibril. Here are cellulases coming in to digest those glucan chains. They're releasing single glucose molecules, and then those glucoses are fed to your microorganism of choice, and microorganism of choice ferments the sugar to ethanol. And they could ferment it to butanol, and they could ferment it to alkanes. But I'm going to suggest to you that there are three issues with this biological conversion pathway. So the first issue is that lignin is not utilized in this pathway. So the 25% of the biomass that is in lignin might be simply burned to, to power biorefinery operations. And I think that's a terrible waste of some beautiful molecular bonds in that structure. The second issue is that the presence of the lignin in and around and coating those polysaccharides interferes with the ability of the enzymes to access those structures. And so you do not recover all of the sugars that you hope for from the biomass material. And then the third issue is that any time you go to a, a fermentation reaction with living microorganisms, some of that glucose is used as a carbon source for the division, the growth, and in the respiration of that microorganism. So some of that CO2 gets thrown back out or it's used for molecules within the organism itself. And we've done a, a back of the envelope calculation that suggests that for each unit of biomass that might enter this pathway, only about one third of the carbons that the plant has so carefully sifted from the atmosphere at 395 parts per million and trapped in photosynthesis into, into a solid body, only one third of those carbons actually make it into a fuel molecule out the other end. So this wouldn't be a problem 
if we could grow unlimited quantities of biomass, we would simply grow as much as we need, throw away two-thirds of the carbon, we're fine. But here's the issue. A biorefinery at scale requires a, a capital investment in the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. And then the transportation costs for lignocellulosic biomass, which is heavy and full of oxygen that, that we don't need, sometimes wet, so we're transporting water. Transporting the biomass beyond a 50-mile radius to the gates of the biorefinery uses more energy than is recovered in the fuel. And so we have to rethink this scenario of having a, a very centralized biofuels operation, because I, I just don't think it, it will work. And we really need to be heading towards some kind of more scalable and, and distributive scenario. So this raises two issues that we need to think about. If we're going to ring a biorefinery with bioenergy crops, we need to get the maximum amount of biomass grown on that acreage. So we need to maximize yield. The other thing we need to do is improve the capture of carbon from the biomass into our desired products. So I'm going to call that the, the carbon efficiency, if you like, because if we can double the carbon efficiency, if we could take it from one third to two thirds, we would half the area of land on which we need to grow bioenergy crops and the investment of water, fertilizer, and energy to do so. So I think the problem of increasing yield is actually a more tractable one than, than we think of at the moment. Our current corn crop, it grows six feet high. So that's a, a reasonable amount of biomass. But we've bred corn for generations to produce grain, to produce these yellow kernels. So we've optimized our plants for grain yield. And we've been extremely successful at doing that. We've increased the yield eight times over the last 60 or 70 years by plant breeding, eight times on the same area of land. What we haven't done is pay any attention to biomass and to the, the height of the plant or the density of the stalks or whether the pith is hollow, whether the stem is hollow inside or whether it's filled with cells. So this guy is not a pygmy. He is actually a considerable size. And this corn plant is actually about 15 feet high. So this is a, a tropical maize variety. It grows well in the Midwest. Um, and it produces probably about uh, two, two and a quarter times the biomass per acre as hybrid corn does. Sweet sorghum, another annual crop that a farmer can choose to, to introduce, also has those kinds of, of yields. So we could make a difference very rapidly, and never mind sort of what we could do additionally to that in terms of accelerated molecular-assisted breeding programs or genetic engineering. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about what's going on in our, our Energy Frontier Research Center. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about the other issue, the, the conversion efficiency. But I'll start with this desired characteristics of a conversion process. So we'd like processes that are independent of the feedstock species, meaning we don't want to care whether it's poplar or willow or switchgrass or miscanthus that is delivered to the biorefinery doors. We want to understand these, these structures at the molecular level so that what we're dealing with is different proportions of cellulose or flavors of hemicellulose or flavors of lignin. We want to maximize the carbon and energy conversion efficiency. 
We'd like to recover desired co-product streams. So the only reason that ethanol plants survive at the moment is actually that they produce dried distillers grains as a co-product. So they ferment the corn. You're left with a nitrogen-rich slurry that's dried and it's sold back as animal feed. And that's how they're staying alive at the moment. We would like to be able to put in place catalyses that allow us to make fine chemicals or other high value co-products because fuel is high volume, but it's low value. So maybe to make the economics of the biorefinery work, we need to be thinking about how some of these other products can be made. And then the scalability. So moving away from needing those hundreds of millions of dollars investment in a biorefinery at scale to processes that could be small, even mobile biorefineries. So can we take a biorefinery to the farm and add energy density to that biomass on site? Or could we have processes that operate at the silo scale? Because there are already delivery systems for getting grain to silos from farms that are six or 10 miles away. And then there are rail systems within at least the Midwest that take uh, those products out from the silo. So the transportation infrastructure is in place uh, at these smaller scales. So our target um, in our center is what we call drop-in biofuels, fuels that are compatible with the existing liquid transportation infrastructure. So not ethanol, but alkanes and the aromatics that we might derive from lignin that would allow us to blend those back together and make something that is gasoline-like. We are roughly equal numbers of plant biologists, chemists, and chemical engineers. So this is our model, and it's drawn from the petrochemical industry. Petrochemical industry takes a barrel of oil, can fractionate it into different streams, and then it uses chemical catalysts, or robust, inert uh, chemical compounds, to transform some of those molecules uh, into um, platform chemicals that can then be used to generate over 50,000, 100,000 different kinds of, of product. So, you derive fuel, but you also derive at least these six platform chemicals from which adhesives and carpeting and cosmetics and paints and rubbers and your iPhone and all the stuff of modern life that, that we're so addicted to uh, is derived. Our research is predicated actually on using <coughs> relatively intact biomass. So many other groups are exploring pathways based on a, a sugar intermediate. They're assuming that there is a clean supply of glucose, or they're assuming that there is a clean supply of an aromatic ring structure. Okay, and we try not to do that. We try to think, well, what will you actually have to deal with? And the chemists in the group are horrified because they're dealing with this very, very complex, messy, dirty substrate in, instead of these nice, clean, single uh, uh, substrate streams. So the material that, that we start with might be um, poplar that has been chipped or it's switchgrass that has been milled uh, or these lodgepole pine chips that are still sort of relatively uh, intact. So we're three years in. This is a, a work in progress. And I thought what I would do is, is actually um, illustrate maybe some of the fun we're having from this very interdisciplinary group of combining biologists and chemists and chemical engineers together to do things that, that we wouldn't normally have thought of doing separately within our, our siloed disciplines, if you will. So um, I'm going to tell you sort of three stories. They're not complete stories, but they illustrate some of the, the dances that we've been doing 
to fulfill our centre mission. And our centre mission, I'll sum up for you in four words. It is no carbon left behind. <laughs> Can we maximise the use of carbon from this biomass? So my first story starts with uh, this molecule here, xylan, which is an abundant hemicellulose in the grass species. It's about 20% of the dry biomass in post-harvest maize stover. And here's the problem. So um, what we would like to do is we would like to upgrade this sugar, xylose, to biofuel. So we would like to strip out some of this oxygen, remove this as, as water molecules, and maybe get to a platform chemical like furfural. That, that could be a, a base for furan-based fuels. The energy content of this molecule is uh, 18 megajoules per kilogram. And just for contrast, the energy density of gasoline is 47. So you can see there's already a problem from having these, this high oxygen content. If we can carry out this reaction, furfural is at 24 megajoules per kilogram. So we will have kept all of the carbons that started out in the xylose, will have 100% of the carbons, but will have one third higher energy density. But here's the problem with doing that. So um, we can take cellulose or hemicellulose, so these chains of sugars linked by the glycosidic bond, and you can treat those with acid. And the acid will hydrolyze the glycosidic linkages and release glucose from cellulose, xylose from xylans. And then that acid will dehydrate that molecule to produce furfural from xylose, hydroxymethyl furfural from glucose. But strong acids will also degrade this structure, and it will degrade the sugars and produce unusable tar. So we will, we will get unacceptable yields from using certain acids. These molecules are the desired products because they're the building blocks for fuels and plastics and, and household chemicals. So what our chemists have done, Madi Abu Omar and, and Nate Mosier, an ag and biological engineer, working together, they've been using a catalysis based on maleic acid. And maleic acid is a relatively mild, uh, dicarboxylic acid is already approved as a use as a, as a food ingredient, so it's fairly mild. This is our cartoon of biomass now. So the, the green cylinders here are the cellulose. Uh, we've got some lignin in there in pink, and, and these blue threads are the xylan hemicelluloses. So in the presence of maleic acid at 160 degrees for 20 minutes, what happens is that this maleic acid deconstructs the xylan to xylose with better than 80% yield. So this can be filtered <coughs> relatively easily, leaving the, the solids, which are now more open and may be accessible to other catalysts or even to enzymes. That xylose in the same reaction pot using the same catalyst, the maleic acid, is now heated to 200 degrees for five to 10 minutes and converts to furfural. So this is a, a two-step, one-pot reaction, starting from relatively intact biomass and making furfural at better than 70% yield, regardless of whether we start from switchgrass or poplar. Lodgepole pine it has a, a problem with. We're down at 40% yield for reasons that we're trying to work out. One more trick that they've done is to now take this furfural over a palladium carbon catalyst and convert it to methyl tetrahydrofuran. And the reason for doing this is that this is immiscible in water. And so it makes the separation of the desired reaction product uh, easier. So that was a chemist working with a, an ag and biological engineer. Now I want to show you how how an, an analytical chemist is working with the chemical engineers to really understand the fundamentals of pyrolysis. So pyrolysis has been 
for decades considered a very promising way to convert biomass. So you heat the biomass to maybe 400, 500 degrees. Uh, it vaporizes. You condense those vapors, and it makes this black bio oil that looks like, you know, maybe you could pour it in a car and start your engine and go. But it's full of moisture, and it's full of oxygen. And that water and oxygen make it extremely corrosive. So you know, don't pour it in your car engine because it, it will have bad consequences. So Hilke Kentema, who's a, a specialist in mass spectrometry, decided that what we needed to do was really to understand what the components of pyrolysis oils were. And so she worked together with the chemical engineers, Fabio Ribeiro, Nick Delgas, and Rakesh Agarwal, and came up with um, uh, just a way of, of allowing the reaction products of the pyrolysis to fly in a mass spectrometer. So what we're looking at now here is M over Z, and then the relative abundance of those mass to charge ions that are uh, in a bio oil made only of cellulose. Okay, so, so this mass spectrum is black with molecular components, or it's red with molecular components, because there's all these different molecular ions that have been made by pyrolyzing a structure made entirely of glucose. It was the simplest thing we could think to pyrolyze, and yet it produces all of these reaction products. And if we're thinking of a, a system where we might want to deoxygenate with a catalyst, those reaction products, no catalyst is going to be able to deal with this level of complexity or as seen in this two-dimensional GC trace, over 3,000 different molecular species. So the engineers started to think, well, maybe we should really go back to basics because obviously if you pyrolyze glucose and you get all these reaction products from it, there must, be, there must be a primary reaction and then you must have additional secondary and tertiary and quaternary reactions that are producing all of these additional higher molecular weight components. So they hypothesized that for the biomass, maybe it's the primary vapors, the vapors that are first made on heating of the biomass that are important to make bio oil that might be stable. Uh, and secondary gases or the secondary tars that are made from reactions that occur amongst these primary vapors and the char in the water are sort of not desirable pathways <laughs> for us. And so what they wanted to understand is what is in the primary vapors? What is it that is first made when you pyrolyze cellulose? So they, they built this, uh, this experimental setup. So this is a commercially available pyroprobe. It's got this platinum filament here that gets resistively heated at 20,000 degrees per second. And so they put very small quantities of cellulose in the order of a, a milligram or so onto this ribbon, heat it extremely quickly to 300 or 400 or 500 degrees, and then quench the reaction once it's in the vapor phase with nitrogen. They do this in the presence of chloride ions because those chloride ions are going to attach to some of the ionic species that are made in here, and then those will be whooshed. I'm told that's the technical term among analytical chemists, whooshed into the mass spectrometer so that we can see what those ions actually are. And this is what they got. So remember that spectrum that was red, completely solid with different molecular species? In this case, it's not. It's predominantly this monomeric species with 197 molecular weight, including 35 for the attached chloride ion to make it fly. Then there's this, what looks to be a dimer of this structure. 
And then even out here at 521, a little bit of, of trimeric species. Platinum, of course, can be a catalyst in its own right. So they determined that the platinum ribbon itself was not catalyzing this reaction. But I, I think the breakthrough here is actually uh, in being able to get to something that is a much more simplified product range. So we're not sure. We think that the predominant product is the levoglucosan or maybe isomers of it. We're still trying to work out because, because modeling suggests that the levoglucosan is not the ultimate thermodynamic sink. So we're trying to do work to establish just um, what, this, what this monomeric form is that, that we're finding. So, as I said, the, the pyroprobe system is looking at milligram quantities of cellulose. And of course, for engineers, this is no good because they want to close a mass balance. They want to say that, that this is the major product that is truly formed. And so what they did was went and talked to uh, some of the guys in aeronautics and aerospace engineering and came up with this, uh, what we call the rocket reactor. So this is a, a long tube into which you can pour 10 grams of cellulose. So not huge amounts, but better than a, a few milligrams. And the heat is provided by a rocket system. It's a hydrogen and oxygen ignition system. And we make them do this experiment very far away from campus. And then the bio oil is collected and after the, the reaction has run and bounced along this, this 65 centimeter tube. So there's enough bio oil recovered from this to be able to, to actually think about a mass balance. So they can look at the product distribution from cellulose that's pyrolyzed in the rocket reactor, and they can close that mass balance to within 20%. So one thing that they noticed is that in the rocket reactor, they're actually getting more of the, the dimeric structures and the trimeric structures, putting us in the C12 to C18 kind of fuel range. Uh, so that is also an interesting finding for us. So this is good. It's a kind of a, a breakthrough in our understanding of what might be going on initially in pyrolysis. And the next step that they're working on is, is how can you then take those, that simplified reaction product profile and deoxygenate it? So they've built this setup uh, with, a, um, with a secondary uh, hydro deoxygenation reactor over here. So here's where the pyrolysis occurs. And then the vapors are fed over here into the hydro deoxygenation reactor. And there's a catalyst in there, a catalytic system, that tries to extract oxygen out of those reaction products. And I'll tell you that you know, because these are incomplete stories, they can pull out about 20% of the oxygen so far from the catalyst systems that they've been trying so far. But so there's still a ways to go. So what can we do then as plant biologists? to assist our, our chemist and chemical engineering friends, uh, really to kind of optimize or, or make the biomass behave better in these kinds of, of conversion pathways. So I want to share just a couple of quick examples of, of what we're doing in that regard. And I'll start here with the observation that um, transition metals, such as iron, are some of our engineers' favorite kinds of catalysts because they're cheap and they're abundant. And our colleagues at, at National Renewable Energy Lab had found that if you, for example, take corn stover, so the, the residual uh, biomass after you've harvested the grain, and soak it in a solution of iron chloride, that all of this type architecture here that you can see by conventional TEM preparations is disrupted by the presence of the iron chloride, those iron ions. So we get this 
this defibrillation. It looks as if maybe those layers of cellulose are separating from each other. It improves access of enzymes uh, in an, an assay just to measure glucose and xylose release from this open structure. So this needs a lot of iron and poses an environmental problem then in, in washing out the iron and disposing of um, the, the water that you've soaked the biomass in. And so we thought that we would take a, a sort of synthetic biology approach to this problem. And our thinking was, well, what about if the iron is going to act as a catalyst, why don't we deliver it out into the cell wall to a specific molecule where we want the catalyst to be near as the plant is growing? Why don't we get the plant to participate in its own deconstruction by embedding these Trojan horse catalysts as the plant is growing? So if iron is your favorite catalyst, we know iron binding peptides. We know blood iron binding peptides. Ferritin is a classic iron binding molecule. Uh, this enzyme, rubridoxin oxygen oxidoreductase from bacteria is an iron binding enzyme. And so we can take the peptide domains that bind these iron ions. We can link them up to uh, a domain found in bacteria or fungi that targets enzymes, or that seems to target enzymes, specifically to cellulose microfibrils. So this is a cellulose binding domain of a protein. Now if we express this protein in our plants, and this is Arabidopsis, our favorite genetic model system, we express this under <coughs> inducible control. So there's a promoter system where the gene is only expressed in the presence of an inducing chemical agent. So we spray the plants with the inducing chemical agent. In this case, it's an estrogen. The plant cells begin to synthesize this, this hybrid protein. It gets exported out into the, the cell wall. We're imaging it here because we've also stuck on a fluorescent reporter protein so that we can see that the, the fusion protein is actually being delivered where we, we want it to be delivered and not getting trapped in the cytoplasm. And then this is the, the preliminary results that we have, which is that in a sacrification assay, we can actually increase the accessibility of the cellulose and the xylan to deconstruction by enzymes. We can get an increase uh, of... Um, 10% actually just by watering iron into wild type plants, but nearly 15% by watering iron into our transgenic lines and then allowing um, enzymes access to those substrates. So my last story is, is um, a collaboration between the plant biologists and the chemists. And it starts with this pesky macromolecule lignin, which is so heterogeneous and so difficult to deconstruct. So lignin is actually a very strange biological molecule. Because if we think of the way that uh, DNA is synthesized, it's made from a template of another DNA molecule. RNA is made using DNA as a template. Proteins are, are synthesized using RNA as a template. Polysaccharides are secondary gene products, so they have to be assembled by enzyme complexes forming. Lignin is entirely untemplated at all. So what you do is you, you synthesize the building bricks, the monolignols, inside the cell. They get exported across the plasma membrane into the cell wall space, and then there's a free radical mediated polymerization mechanism that we don't understand very well. And that mechanism allows this monster of a lignin macromolecule with all of these different linkages to come together. So 
the chemist decided that, well, this is too horrifically complicated to start with. Let, let's go for looking at a, a very simple model. We'll take two aromatic rings and we'll stick them together with a, a beta O4 ether linkage. So they synthesized this molecule and then they screened for a catalytic system that would break the ether bond without disrupting the ring aromaticity. Okay, so we don't want to open up this ring because this is a nice energy rich structure. We'd like to preserve that. We would simply like to break the bonds that hold the aromatic rings together. So with a zinc, palladium and carbon system in the presence of, of hydrogen and at 150 degrees, that's just what they found was a catalyst that would break this molecule into two pieces and that they could recover it at stoichiometric yields. So then they thought, well, maybe we should extend this chain length. Let's not just go for two aromatic rings linked together. Let's build 12 rings. Let's build 20 rings that are all linked with this single molecular bond. And again, the catalyst does extremely well, takes this, this uh, substrate and breaks it down into single aromatic residues. Here's what it does on some real lignin out of a biorefinery. So this is oak lignin, okay? And it's been through a, it, it's the end product of a pulp and paper mill. And it's dissolved in organosolve. And you can see again, all of those complex molecular species that are left in this oak lignin. In the green is what the catalyst does to this. So it helps because it breaks some of the beta O4 ether linkages. So it reduces the average molecular weight of the components in here. It reduces the average molecular size, uh, oh, sorry, uh, abundance of the, the components in here. But it's still giving us this mess of products. However, the plant biologists have known for some years, and this is work from Clint Chappell's lab, how the biosynthetic pathway from phenylalanine to guaiacyl lignin, G lignin, or syringal lignin, the other main flavor of lignin in the plant, how that is, is achieved. And so now that they understand this biosynthetic pathway that includes modifications to the side chains or to the rings of phenylalanine to make these monolignol products. And remember that those just get pushed out into the cell wall space and then are randomly polymerized together. What we've found, or what Clint has found, is that by modulating the activity of the biosynthetic enzymes in this pathway, you can control the shunt of carbon from this pathway, specifically into S or G lignin. So by overexpressing the enzyme here, ferrolate 5-hydroxylase, all of the carbon that enters this pathway ends up in the syringal monolignols. Okay? And what's exciting about that is that syringal lignin is two aromatic residues linked with a beta O4 ether. So this is paper that has been made from transgenic poplar trees that have different compositions, quantities of syringal lignin in them. So here's wild type poplar, which is a mix of syringal and guaiacyl lignin. Here's high S, so this is now 70% or so syringal lignin 30% guaiacyl lignin, and this is the highest S. So this is a poplar tree that grows with 97% syringal lignin content. And what our chemists are testing right now is chips of poplar wood from these trees and whether in fact we can extract all of the syringal lignin with their chemical catalyst that attacks the beta O4 ether linkages. So 
how can we optimize biomass for new conversion pathways? So as a plant biologist, I, I like to keep myself in a job thinking of this. So I've talked about xylan to furfural using the malic acid catal catalysis. We can think about ways of increasing the content proportionately of xylans within this material or increasing the pentose to hexose ratios because this catalysis will also work on, on arabinans. I talked about cellulose to simple primary products in fast hydropyrolysis, and we're working on engineering metal binding catalysts into plants that may be Trojan horse catalysts that would reduce the energy inputs needed for this thermochemical pathway. I talked about the cleavage of ether bonds in lignin using this zinc palladium carbon catalyst, and so we're thinking of engineering plants that only contain this flavor of lignin or engineering lignin that might incorporate catalysts in vivo. So this is our roadmap for the, the center. Uh, we're interested in how we can deliver these wall components, how we can modify the polysaccharide and the lignin composition, and maybe even incorporate these Trojan horse catalysts to produce what we call tailored biomass, that is biomass that is optimized for its downstream uses. And those downstream uses, the pathways that we're following are sort of selective catalytic conversions or selective hydropyrolytic conversion to desired reaction products, starting from cellulose, xylan, and lignin to make the aromatics in the hydrocarbons that we hope will be drop-in fuel intermediates. So this is the team. Um, we're, a, we're a, a team made from Purdue University, National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, Argonne National Lab, and a few individuals from University of Tennessee and from Northeastern University. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, you started one step later than I hoped you would. Um, it worries me that the process of photosynthesis is really inefficient in taking solar energy and turning it into something, some form of energy that we can use. And I can't remember what the number is because I'm old and senile, but it doesn't seem to me that it's much better than 1% or 2% at the best for that initial conversion step. Uh, how does this alter all of the things you talk about here? Does, I mean, they're, they're great. They're wonderful. But it, it means that uh, it's a very inefficient use of land area uh, for collecting solar energy, no? Well, you're right. And probably the best that we could hope for would be a 6% efficiency from a C4 crop which has a better utilization of carbon dioxide than in C3 grasses. But nevertheless, you're quite right. The solar efficiency is not great. Nevertheless, planting seeds in a field is something that we've done for years and years. And if we think of, of the agricultural waste that we currently use, even if we only used half of the biomass and plowed under the residual half of the stover, we would still be able to add billions of gallons of fuel to the, the mandate from Congress for a, a drop-in biofuel. So, so we have a congressional mandate for 36 billion gallons by 2022. We're not going to hit it. We're nowhere near it. There's barely any steel in the ground when it comes to a cellulosic biorefinery. There's maybe only two companies that, that do that. But what those two companies do is use the cobs that are left after you've stripped off the, the grain and some of the stover that is going to be a waste product anyway. You may as well harvest that carbon and put it to use. And I, I think that, you know, it, it's, we've seen the dangers in becoming dependent on one source 
for our liquid transportation fuels. That's why we have an addiction to oil. I think we need to start diversifying. So we need solar, we need wind, we need biomass and biofuels, and we need a whole range of technologies because diversification gives you some resilience and flexibility in the energy supply system. Great. With a wonderful large center like this, you can bring a lot of different people uh, into this to focus on a problem. And I was wondering the extent to which you've brought in people with expertise in, say, life cycle analysis or the economics on this, because you started this out by talking about the scale of the issue. Yes. And there are some things that if we look at the energy return on investment or the economic return on investment, by working with people with that type of expertise, they may tell you this is some really interesting science over here, but you're never going to scale it or yes. they would help you identify and prioritize. So I was wondering the extent to which you had brought in people with that type of expertise. So, so that is a great question. <laughs> and unfortunately, the answer is barely at all because the, the funding that we have, although it feels generous, Ed, Ed and Emily will know this, it doesn't go as far as you hope it's going to go. You think $20 million sounds a lot, but once it gets distributed among 24 co-eyes, it's a grad student or a postdoc each. And so we've had to go outside of the center to look for funds that would support a techno-economic analysis. And for example, Nate has applied for funding for his, his um, malic acid technology to, to analyze that and say, well, yes, this is a, an economically viable pathway to do this, right? So you're quite right, and it is a gap for us. And we do have colleagues at Purdue that are outside of the center that are interested in the economic and the policy aspects, and we tap into them whenever we can. Um, let me just add another dimension to this problem, the complexity of the energy and fuels, that uh, Emily and I, we had another center, EFRC center at Princeton, that's on the combustion of things. You talk of a life cycle analysis, one aspect of it's after they made this wonderful fuse, does it burn well, for example? Okay, that's a totally, it's, it's another uh, uh, Absolutely. big, big problem. Uh, DOE is trying to coordinate us because uh, uh, we are in the same, uh, there's a team. At, uh, there are several centers together and uh, we know each other, what they are doing. And then that would provide some indication, guidance to us and how we'll see how they burn. I mean, for example, you, you, on the one hand, you want to take away oxygen, of course, you know. But you want to probably leave a little bit of oxygen there because that helps with uh, reducing the soot. The, if you don't have, you know, if, if it's totally heavily carbon, carbonated fuel, it can produce a lot of soot. And that's no good either. So, so as you say, it's the, it's the whole picture. It's, uh, and, it, and I think as well, just to follow up on that, is that... Um, of course, our centers are funded out of basic energy sciences from the Office of Science. So they want the product to be science, if you like. And really, the, the technology arm of DOE, the EERE, is not tightly involved with this. Which is a big mistake. Which is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, we're doing fundamental research, but we're also generating provisional patent applications and disclosures, and Ed and Emily Center will be doing the same thing. But, you know, we, we have no funds to kind of do the, the techno-economic analysis that we would like to do, or even the systems engineering perspective that would say, how do you take these pieces and stitch them together, right? So we have some relatively naive ideas that might be, okay, if we can deconstruct syringeal lignin, why don't we turn this thing on its head, take the lignin out first, and then deal with residual polysaccharides, right? Instead of how people think in, in the other way around. They generally tend to think of removing polysaccharides and leaving behind the lignin. So, no, we don't have those pieces, and we absolutely should. Actually, I'll take a moment is this the one that works or not? This one. Okay. Uh, and to ask you a question that's a, a bit related, not so much about the economic analysis, but with regard to life cycle. Um, you mentioned in, 
and maybe I heard you wrong, but your trigger for releasing the Trojan horse was estrogen. Oh, yes. Um, I don't know that I want a trigger I'm of, sure of you estrogen don't. Yes. based <laughs> on the concerns people have about endocrine disruptors and, in the, in the, and yes. hormones that, that are getting into our water supply. Yes. So what, what, do you, what do you have let, to say about let, you? Let me that? clarify. <laughs> yes, thank you, actually, because let me clarify that. We're not proposing that we would put these crops out into the field and, and grow them and spray them with estrogens, not by, not by a long shot. These are research tools for us in order to understand some of the catalysis that can occur when we cite these catalysts close to the molecular bonds that we want to break, right? So if you like, the, the notion here is simply inducible control. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be estrogen. There are promoter systems that will act with alcohol, a little light spray of ethanol, and you can induce uh, gene expression at certain times. Okay. So, so also, this was an Arabidopsis, which is a weed, and, and this is not a technology that we're necessarily going to immediately start in a bioenergy crop species, okay. right? So it's a sort of proof of concept. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if, if there are no further burning questions, I'd like to invite you to uh, come to the reception and you can ask Maureen questions individually. And let's, let's thank Maureen again. For that.